Well, it's a great pleasure to welcome Robert Lloyd George to Business at Night. Robert is the Chief Investment Officer of Lloyd George Advisory in Hong Kong, and he has written an excellent monthly update for February 2016, and it is entitled Life Below Zero. How are you, Robert? Fine, thanks. Good evening, John, and it's a pleasure to talk to you again. Well, we've got a very challenging situation trying to figure out these markets and keying off your outlook for 2016 and onwards. Let's talk about negative interest rates. Well, I think this is the most incredible development, which the Bank of Japan obviously has focused our minds on in the last few weeks, following the European Central Bank in actually moving to the stance that they could no longer go on printing money, buying assets in terms of bonds and, of course, stocks in Tokyo, they had to do something more. And so they moved the interest rate from zero to minus 0.1%. In other words, for large Japanese banks depositing money with the central bank, they will have to actually pay for that privilege instead of being paid interest. It hasn't yet reached the point where individual savers and depositors would have to pay. But I think that is happening in Europe now. And I think it could be a global trend. Who knows whether we may get to that point if Janet Yellen's failed interest rate rise last December turns into a tougher situation during the remainder of this year where they not only cannot raise interest rates, but may be looking at the same kind of choices that the Japanese Central Bank has indicated, and they would also move to negative interest rates. And I looked at the history of this, and I couldn't find any previous example of this occurring. And in fact, the lowest interest rate in the last 500 years we had was in the UK in the 18th century was around 2% on government bonds. So we've never seen these low interest rates before. And I don't think anybody really knows what the effect would be. One of my conclusions was that Gold is interesting. I think we have to look at good dividend yield stocks. That's another conclusion which is clear because bonds are not going to give us what we need, particularly retired people looking for income. Now, we're living in a competitive devaluation world and official and unofficial currency pegs are being tested. I wonder if you could comment on competitive devaluations. Certainly, John. I mean, I think the Japanese, again, started this by pushing the yen down last year. And ironically, this negative interest rate has boomeranged on them, and the yen's gone up recently in the last week or two. But clearly, all the other currencies around Asia are moving down against the U.S. dollar. And obviously, Australia has moved with Canada and has gone down about 30%, I think, against the U.S. dollar. We've seen it in Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Korea, And of course, China has been holding out, and the indications are that they will resist market forces as long as they are able to do so with their large foreign exchange reserves, and there are questions about that now, and with tighter capital controls on the outflow of capital. So I think that this competitive devaluation game is a very real threat for investors, and we need to monitor it carefully. At the moment, I think China's probably got temporarily anyway, control of the situation, and we will not see more devaluation of the renminbi in the immediate month or two. Uh, What is your sense of non-performing loans in China and how that's going to unfold? Very, very hard to get, you know, real numbers on this, John. I think that the total figure for national debt in China is now something like three times GDP which would be around $30 trillion. And nobody knows what the non-performing loan figure is, but I've seen figures of 10 to 15%, as high as $5 trillion. That would be a real challenge for China to try and roll over those loans, which they've done in the past. Because they have a totally state-controlled banking system, they can, to some extent, roll over and postpone the problem And, you know, we've seen plenty of Western countries doing that, but I think it will become more difficult for them. And we saw in January what they call the total social funding or lending figure dramatically. It was up something like 15 or 20 percent. 
But the GDP growth is not responding to that. So the more debt but less growth situation is not promising, I think, for China. You've been redeploying assets, and India and its surrounding markets are an investment sweet spot. Yes. First of all, how can we conserve capital for investors? And secondly, where can we see real growth? And will investors pay a premium for that real growth? And I think, as I say, China's slowing down. There are risks in China. I think Hong Kong is being squeezed. So is Singapore by the slowdown in China and pressure on their currencies and wages and real estate. So when we look around the region, the one country which stands out as having real growth of nearly 8%, really good companies in the consumer space, a young demographic, a decent pro-business government, a democracy is India. In fact, you know, I've been investing in, in India for over 30 years now, and it's always a long, slow process. You don't want to take short-term views there. But I think that we will, over the next two to five years, have a very good return from investing in India because the currency is stable. The growth is there. We see 20% earnings growth. They are making significant savings from the oil imports, which have cut $150 billion from their import bill. So I think India could be the biggest winner of all the emerging markets. Robert, I have to ask you about the debate that's taking place in the British House of Commons over Brexit. It's fascinating, John. And I think, you know, talking of devaluations, we've seen sterling come off quite sharply in the last two days when Boris Johnson threw his hat in the ring and announced that he would lead the Britain getting out of the European Union movement. And about a third of Cameron's party are opposing membership. I have a great admiration for David Cameron. I think he's a decent, honorable man who's trying to do the best for our country. But it is clear that there is a strong popular feeling that we don't want to be part of European supranational bureaucracy and be subject to these huge flows of immigration which are swamping Eastern Europe and Germany. And I think that is the key concern. I've been writing about Churchill and and Lloyd George, and I I think that Churchill very clearly said he believed in a united Europe, but he wasn't sure whether England should be part of it. So that is, I think, the historic question that we are going to face again this June 23rd for Britain. Well, Robert, that's a great update, and I thank you and hope you have a very good weekend, and we'll look forward to talking again soon. Thank you so much, John. Good to talk to you.